Hey, everybody. Um, so we've been talking in class about um, statistical inference, which is the idea that you um, use statistical approaches to infer, say, parameter values or some information about uh, a model, say, a probability distribution from observed data. And one of the types of statistical inference that we might um, care about is called point estimation, where we're essentially trying to estimate the value of a specific point or, say, parameter value, um, like the mean or the variance of a distribution. And so um, today I wanted to um, go back over some material that we talked about in lecture, um, just so that you have it kind of on record and you can go uh, back and listen to it as many times as you want. Um, and basically, this, this is going to cover two approaches for doing point, point estimation. That is um, the uh, method of moments approach, as well as the maximum likelihood estimator. So uh, we're going to look at two different ways of estimating points. And let's go ahead and get started with that. Okay, the first thing that I wanted to note was that um, on one of my previous um, lectures, uh, this too was missing from um, the uh, estimate of variance um, when you had a dependent random variable that depended on two uh, independent ran random variables, x1 and x2. And so basically the variance uh, was equal to the sum of the variances for x1 and x2 weighted by their coefficients uh, squared. And then also we had this uh, covariance term, but um, in my previous lecture slides, uh, this two was missing. So I just kind of wanted to that, point that out right away so you, uh, you have that um, uh, kind of in your mind. All right, so let's go ahead and, and get started then. Um, again, we're talking about point estimation, um, and there are really two ways we can do point estimation. Uh, we can use, at least that we're gonna talk about today, um, we're gonna use either the uh, method of moments or the method of maximum likelihood. Um, and then we talked in class a little bit about how, regardless of which estimator that you use for estimating points, the ideal estimator is going to be characterized by a set of traits uh, listed here, unbiasedness, consistency, efficiency, sufficiency. Um, and basically then uh, one can evaluate these different estimators using these sets of traits. And uh, oftentimes the um, method of maximum likelihood or maximum likelihood estimation comes out on top in that regard. Okay, so let's start uh, from the beginning. <clears throat> the method of moments approach. Um, the idea basically is to use the sample moments of, such as the mean and the variance as estimators for the mean and variance of the distribution from which you can calculate distribution parameters. So uh, here's kind of a pictorial how that works. So out in the wild, there's a population that you're drawing from, which has a um, mean and uh, variance, which you would like to know, but you don't necessarily know. So basically, you go out and you sample that real world, or you sample the wild, and you end up with a set of observations, in this case, x1 through xn. And from those observations, you calculate a mean um, called the sample mean. And then you also ca calculate a variance called the sample variance. The reason is the sample variance and the sample mean is that it's calculated from the samples, which are in turn sampling some real world distribution. Um, and then basically uh, the method of moments approach says, hey, let's just go ahead and set the mean of the distribution, whatever probability distribution we're interested in, equal to the sample mean and likewise set the variance of that probability distribution equal to the sample variance. And then from that, we can directly estimate the uh, uh, probability distribution parameters so long as, as we um, have uh, no more than two parameters. Obviously, we have more than two parameters and we need more than just two equations to solve for the two parameters. And so basically, again, um, this is kind of the, uh, the tool, this is the method of moments. Why is it the method of moments? Because basically we're taking the uh, first moment to get the mean, uh, and then we're taking the second, second centered moment to get the variance. Remember the reason it's centered is because we're subtracting out the mean before we uh, square it and then sum over all of the observations. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here is this n minus one appears in the denominator. You might wonder where that's coming from. And it's coming because um, when we're, Calculating the variance here, basically there's kind of two different random variables that are uh, that we're kind of um, using basically to get that estimate. One 
is the individual observations xi, which you can imagine are drawn from a random variable um, from the sample population. So that's going to there's going to be some variability associated with xi, and that's obviously what we're trying to characterize with the sample variance. But also, it turns out that when we calculate the mean as the um, sum over all the observation divided by the number of observations, that too is going to be a random variable because you can imagine if you had a different set of sample um, samples that you collected, so you had a different set of xi, you would get a slightly different mean. So basically, this mean in turn is also a random variable. So basically, you got a random variable minus a random variable, and then you're using that to calculate a variance, which of course is another random variable. And the bottom line is that because we have uncertainty in both the xi's and also in the sample mean, um, we tend, we might underestimate the variance if we just had n in the denominator here. And so we put an n minus 1 to increase the variance slightly, and that also, um, as it, we'll find out later, means that the um, sample variance is calculated in this way is what's called an unbiased estimator. That is, um, the expected value of that sample variance is the actual population variance. Okay, and so uh, just a quick note too that, that this form of the sample variance, this formula for the sample variance can be rewritten in terms of essentially the sum of squares of all observations minus n times the mean of all the observations squared. And uh, oftentimes that's an easier way to calculate the sample variance because it's really easy to sum up over the uh, uh, squares. <clears throat> and then of course usually you know the mean and you know the number of samples that you've collected and so you can easily ca calculate the sample variance. Okay, so once you have the sample mean and the sample variance, uh, depending on the distribution of interest, you would then go about calculating the corresponding parameter values. So for example, let's choose a really tough one here. Let's go for the Gaussian or normal distribution right here. Um, if we knew the uh, sample mean and sample variance denoted here by mu and uh, sigma squared, or in our case, that would be x bar and s squared. Um, basically, then you can just set those equal to the uh, the mean and the variance for your um, the two parameters in the Gaussian distribution, and you're done. So you've got basically the two parameters immediately um, for the Gaussian distribution. For other distributions, it's not, it's not quite that same, straightforward. So for example, if we're looking at the log normal, then we want to calculate the um, parameters lambda and zeta. And here's the relationship between the mean, which we're going to approximate using our uh, first uh, moment or, or mean of the sample data. Um, and here's the variance, which we're going to uh, basically set equal to the sample variance. And so then you end up with two equations, this top equation with the number on the left-hand side and the bottom equation with the number on the left-hand side um, in two unknowns, lambda and zeta, and obviously uh, you could uh, solve for lambda and zeta given those two equations, and so on and so forth. You know, one could go to the gamma distribution, for example, and there you have two parameters, nu and k, and if you knew the mean and the variance from the samples, then you could estimate uh, k and nu uh, from two equations and two unknowns. And so, um, so that's that's the um, the gist of the um, method moment for estimating a point. Um, you just simply calculate the first and second centered moments of the data, and then set those equal to the mean and the variance um, in your parameter distribution, and then calculate from that the uh, parameter values. Okay, so um, now let's go on to perhaps a more interesting and versatile approach, which goes way beyond estimating parameters for probability distributions. It's used a lot in, in other kinds of um, sort of data model um, fitting, lots of different kinds of applications for this. It's called the method of maximum likelihood or ma maximum likelihood estimation is another uh, term, MLE, that's used. And here's the basic idea. Um, so you basically imagine some, in our case, a probability density function um, is the model of interest with a single parameter, which we're going to uh, call theta. So we've got a PDF, um, there's going to be some uh, random variable x with a realization little x, and um, this uh, distribution uh, has a single parameter theta. An example would be if we go back to our table, an example would be the exponential distribution, which has only one parameter, and that's lambda. So anyway, we've got some PDF, um, which is a function of a single parameter theta. 
And now imagine that we go out and we collect a bunch of measurements from the wild. And so we end up with a bunch of values for x, x1, x2, and so forth and so on through xn. So we collected n samples. And basically what we'd like to do is we'd like to find out what is the most likely, or answer the question, what is the most likely value of the parameter theta that would give rise to these measurements? Um, and that most likely value uh, we refer to as the maximum likelihood estimate, or MLE, for theta. All right, how do we do that? Um, well, basically it's about sort of tuning the, um, the sample density, um, sort of where all your sample values kind of clustered, you can think of it that way, with the probability density associated with your distribution function. So you're gonna tune that parameter so that the probability density associated with the PDF aligns in some way uh, some perfect way <laughs> or non-perfect uh, with the uh, the sort of clustering of the data that you collected. And, and so basically what you're assuming is essentially every sample that you collect, the sort of the probability of getting that particular value, uh, say xi, is going to be proportional to the PDF evaluated xi given some theta value. And, uh, and so you're going to be tuning that theta so that basically the likelihood of getting a specific value of uh, x is going to be reflected in the probability density associated with that value of x. Um, and of course, we sampled more than one point, right? Um, we didn't just sample a single value. Uh, and so that gives, a, gives us a little bit more resolution. So we can say, well, look, if we took all of those values, then we're interested in tuning theta such that, that the um, clustering of those values uh, it reflects the intersection of the PDF um, at all of those values given some uh, value of theta. And if that doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense, just hold on a second and hopefully it will. Um, from those intersections, one can define a likelihood function, um, which is essentially the product of the PDFs evaluated at all of those different um, uh, sample points uh, given, again, a, a value of theta. And you can imagine that essentially since x1, x2 through xn are given, there's just sample values, say TC uh, concentrations that were measured in the beach or in the water at the beach, um, that really the right-hand side here is a function of, of theta alone. So we can kind of tune that theta to match up the actual probability distributions that, um, or sample distributions that we collected. And so here's the, the kind of key idea that, that is that the best parameter estimate for theta will be the one that maximizes this likelihood function. Um, and another way of saying that is that the best parameter estimate minimizes agreement um, or maximizes, sorry, agreement between the model and the data. And so if you had a bunch of observations, say around 10, and then your theta was such that the PDF had a lot of probability density around 10, then you would be essentially maximizing that likelihood function. So you're trying to then, in that case, find the theta value which shifts that probability density associated with f to around 10, just as an example. Okay, so um, basically, uh, then if we buy everything that I've just said, then the, um, the approach for finding the optimal value of theta, because I was talking about tuning it, right? So how do you do that kind of in an automated way, automatic, ha, automated way or automatic way? Um, the way of finding that theta is, is essentially a min-max problem. So we, we want to maximize the likelihood function. Um, or we could say, uh, since the likelihood function often varies over many log units, we could say that we want to maximize then the log likelihood function. Um, or we could actually say that we want to minimize the minus log likelihood function. They're all equivalent statements. <clears throat> and if we're going to um, sort of maximize or minimize any of those functions, basically it's a min-max problem. So we take the derivative of the likelihood function or the log likelihood function with respect to the parameter value, and then we set that equal to zero, and where the we have a root of that equation, basically, where theta satisfies that equation, we're gonna call that particular theta, theta hat, that's your optimal parameter, because that's giving you the, uh, in this case, the maximum, um, the value of theta for which the uh, likelihood function is maximized. Um, and again, we could do the same thing with the log likelihood function. We just take the derivative of the log likelihood function with respect to theta, set it equal to zero, 
And then the theta value that satisfies that equation is going to be our optimal theta hat value. Um, and of course, if we had a bunch of parameters, say to, so we had n parameters, I don't know why I used n for both the sample size and the parameter size, but anyway, um, say you had n theta values, um, then you would just end up with a set of n coupled equations where you're taking the, the partial derivative now of the, in this case, the log likelihood with respect to each individual uh, parameter value, setting that equal to zero, and then looking uh, for the set now of theta hat j values that collectively satisfy that coupled set of equations. All right, so that's enough theory. Let's kind of get into a little bit of practice and see if we can um, understand this first intuitively and then mathematically. So uh, example 6.3 um, basically is like this. We um, are sitting in a, a toll booth on a bridge and we've got a stopwatch and basically uh, every time a car pulls up um, and we, um, we collect the money and the guy drives off, we hit the stopwatch and, and then we record the time uh, interval between when that car left and the next one arrives. So uh, we're calling that the successive arrival times. You can also think of it as a recurrence interval. Um, and then basically, um, maybe it was kind of a lazy uh, <laughs> toll booth operator. He didn't want to collect a lot of data, but this is the data that, that uh, he gave to us. He basically found that um, out of uh, seven measurements uh, of this recurrence interval, um, the times were as follows. So basically time between cars was 1.2 seconds, 3 seconds, 6.3 seconds, 10.1 seconds, 5.2 seconds, 2.4 seconds, and 7.1 seconds. Um, and so we're asked to uh, model these inner arrival times or, or recurrence intervals uh, using the exponential distribution. Um, and you know, just as a side note, that actually makes a lot of sense. And we could have just been told to model this as an exponential distribution, and there's no reason we can't do that. Um, but actually, in this particular case, we know that the exponential distribution um, is likely to be the correct distribution to model these data because if the arrival times at the toll booth are governed by a Poisson process, we know that the time to sort of the first event, or say the first car, um, is going to be given by the exponential distribution. And in fact, all recurrence um, times will also be given by the uh, the exponential distribution. And so, uh, so we have kind of a theoretical basis for believing that the exponential distribution is the right distribution, distribution to use in this case. But anyway, we didn't need to know that. Um, we're just kind of smart that way. Um, and so given the fact that we're using the exponential distribution, we've been asked to um, use the um, maximum likelihood method or an MLE approach to estimate the parameter value for that distribution given these data. And so, um, so here's the deal. Um, we are given the exponential distribution PDF, which is written here, and lambdas are a single parameter that we need to estimate. We um, have a set of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven observations of recurrence intervals uh, that we're going to fit that um, PDF to. And our goal is to use MLE to estimate a value of lambda. Um, so I mentioned that the MLE approach is essentially trying to tune the parameters so that it best, so that the PDF um, probability density predicted by the PDF best matches the probability density that is kind of inherent in the data set. And to really get your head around that, I think you need to look at the probability density in the data set and, and try to really understand what we're talking about there. So to help you intuitively in that regard, I basically have taken those measurements of recurrence intervals here, and I've used a Mathematica command called histogram to prepare a histogram from these. And the automatic there just means that the bin width, which is the sort of number of seconds um, that we're going to pool all of those data into, uh, is automatically chosen by Mathematica to you know satisfy certain statistical constraints or whatever. Um, and so basically what it's saying in this case, it chose automatic and it chose, uh, automatically chose a, um, a bin size of five seconds. So basically it counts up in this case, we're counting the number of cars that fall into each of these bins. So basically recurrence intervals between zero and five seconds, basically there were three cars which 
fit that recurrence interval. Um, then there were three more cars which fit the recurrence interval between five and 10 seconds. And there was a single car, you can just see on the, um, the right axis here, or the vertical axis one, that would be a single car, which had an arrival time of between 10 and 15 seconds. And so um, this is a histogram. And what I'm, remember what I'm trying to do is get to some estimate of probability density, which I can compare directly to the PDF. But, but this is a start. Histograms um, are often used to visualize kind of how the data are distributed across um, a, a particular variable. And so that's what we're doing here. We're histogramming that, that recurrence interval data. Um, but of course, we don't measure PDFs um, in count. That's not the units. Um, it's probability density. So we need to convert counts into probability first. And like we said in class, the way, of course, to do that is you've got seven cars in total. And so you just divide each of the um, counts in the bins here by seven. Uh, and that way, um, when you sum up over all the bins, you'll get unity. So it sort of satisfies the minimum criteria of a PDF, that is, that it uh, has area of unity under the um, curve. Actually, <laughs> I, I should say it satisfies the minimum criteria of a PMF, or probability mass function, which is that you can sum the, the probability uh, to one. And so basically, I've done that again. Now, I just executed another Mathematica um, uh, uh, command called histogram, same command. Um, but this time, instead of, um, instead of writing count in the last um, category, I'm asking it to plot the histogram in terms of probability. And so basically, what it's done is it's just taken these count numbers and divided by seven, like I said. And then now we've got um, probability on the vertical axis here. So if you add it up uh, a little over 0.4 and 0.4, that's like, I don't know, about 0.8 something or another. And then you add a little bit, um, like closer to 1.5, 1.7, and you're going to get one. So uh, the sum of these um, PMF um, uh, bars here is going to be one as expected. But of course, we want to compare this to a probability density function, and probability is different than probability density. Remember, probability density is the probability per unit um, sort of delta uh, x, if you will, uh, of seconds uh, in this particular case, or per unit um, distance along the uh, x-axis. And so um, in order to get a PDF, I can again ask Mathematica to histogram the data. But this time, I'm going to ask for a PDF, uh, which is going to then uh, automatically shift the vertical axis to be probability density. And all it's doing is it's taking this probability in the PMF, and it's dividing it by the, uh, the width of the bars, which is kind of the delta distance we go here. And so then now we're down to uh, like 0.81 or something as the maximum value. OK, so the really the point is that now we've sort of um, uh, presented our data set as probability density. So you can see most of the density associated with that, um, those data are between, say, 0 and 10 seconds. And there's a little bit um, left over in the 10 to 15 second uh, range. And so we want to compare that probability density that was observed, the observed probability density, with the probability density predicted by the exponential um, function, or PDF. And here's the key part. We want to tune the parameter, in this case lambda, so that the probability density predicted by the PDF, the exponential PDF, you know, in some way um, ideally or optimally matches the probability density that we actually observed in the raw data. So that's kind of the key point. And I'm basically set up in the PowerPoint presentation a video to show you that concept. Actually, the video doesn't work. Uh, for uh, Google Slides, so I'm just going to go over to Mathematica and see if I can uh, see get you that. Let me just try to stop the screen share here. Okay, and now we're going to go to Mathematica. Here we go. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing um, this uh, animation, and so basically I can grab the little toggle here and change the value of lambda dynamically. And let me first explain what we're looking at. So the vertical axis is, again, a probability density. And the horizontal axis is um, recurrence time in seconds. Uh, and these dots here correspond to the kind of the midpoint of the histogram. So remember, we had uh, 
a histogram value. Uh, the first uh, bin was around 0.08, and the second bin was around 0.08, and then the last bin was down here. Some I don't know what that value is. But anyway, these just represent the probability densities of the data approximately. And so now I can change the value of, of lambda, and you can see what happens is that essentially the exponential distribution um, you know, it never really perfectly fits the data, but, you know, certainly that's a terrible fit of the data, right? That that particular choice of lambda, lambda 0 0.1, would be a terrible representation of the probability density associated with the data. Likewise, I could come all the way out here and, well, actually, lambda equal to 10 might not be a bad representation, but probably there's somewhere in the middle here, I don't know exactly where, where the um, probability density predicted by the PDF is reasonably representing the observed probability density. And that's what we're trying to achieve with the, um, with the MLE. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint for a second. All right, and so let's think about how that works mathematically. Again, we have our likelihood function. Um, that's just kind of the definition of likelihood function. In this case, we've got seven recurrence times. So that's T1 through T7, and our parameter that we're trying to fit is lambda. Um, and then we've got that exponential distribution evaluated at the seven uh, points, and I'll multiply together. Um, our seven recurrence times are given here. Our exponential distribution is given there. And so basically we can um, you know, uh, just substitute these two into our likelihood function, and here's what we get. So this is our likelihood function for that particular set of data, assuming that an exponential PDF applies. And um, I guess the point is that, that some of the terms in this likelihood function, if you choose a really bad value of lambda, some of those terms are gonna be zero, which is gonna make the likelihood function very small. Um, and, and if multiple of those terms are close to zero, then you know, it's gonna be even smaller. Um, but there's probably an optimal value of lambda out there that's going to uh, sort of maximize that likelihood function, which is really then saying that the probability density predicted by the uh, PDF is matching the probability density that we actually observed with the, uh, the data. Um, and here's just kind of an exercise along those lines. I mean, we kind of saw it visually with the uh, animation, um, but if we choose a value of lambda that's very small, basically what happens is the likelihood function evaluates to an extremely small number because multiple of those terms are zero. Um, and then if we chose a value that was too big, say lambda equal to 10, the likelihood function is still pretty small. And, but if we choose one that's just about right, say around a lambda of five, we get um, a likelihood function, which at least is a little bit bigger. So the question is, what is the, um, oh, and, and I have one more animation to kind of illustrate that point here. Let me just go back to the Mathematica presentation for a second. So Mathematica, here we come. So I'm gonna go on down to, so here's a second animation. Basically the top graph is the one you've seen already. So the vertical axis here is probability density. The horizontal axis is time in seconds. So we've seen that, that before. I'm just gonna run the cursor so you can see that that's, <laughs> that should look familiar. The bottom axis or the bottom graph here, basically the vertical axis is the, um, the likelihood function um, that we prepared from these data and the exponential PDF. And the um, horizontal axis is gonna be the value of lambda that I'm scrolling through. So you can see I'm starting out at a lambda 0.1 and my cursor is way over to the left, reflecting that choice of lambda. And you can also see the max, the likelihood uh, function is very small. So basically as I drag that lambda up, you can see what's happening is that the, uh, well obviously the ball's moving to the right on the lower graph because lambda is increasing, but also we're gonna start seeing that um, likelihood function increase as we get a better match between the probability density predicted by the exponential PDF and the probability density in the observed data. And we keep on dragging it until finally the, um, the likelihood uh, essentially peaks or reaches a maximum of around 4.9 or around five um, per second. And then as we continue to increase lambda, you can see the, uh, the likelihood function declines. And so really what we're looking for is then to find that optimal value, which is the peak value. 
And as if we are, as we've already talked about, that can easily be done uh, by essentially just maximizing that function. And so now let's go back to the PowerPoint and finish that thought. And so, yeah, so that's the value that we're looking for. We just need to get at it mathematically. And I guess the next point is that, that for some of these problems, you can derive the maximum, li maximum likelihood estimate analytically. And this is one of those problems. And so you basically take that exponential PDF, um, you write out the uh, likelihood function. In this case, we're just writing it out mathematically as the product of all of the PDFs evaluated at the different times um, that we sampled from i equals 1 to n. I'm just keeping it kind of general, but we know in our case n is 7 because we had sam 7 recurrence times. And again, this is all going to be a function of lambda. So I substitute in my exponential PDF. That's what that is there. Now I have this quantity multiplied together uh, n times. Um, each um, time I multiply it, I'm just changing the, uh, the ti value. Uh, since lambda does not depend on the index i, basically that's we're just multiplying 1 over lambda n times, so I can pull that out of the, um, the product symbol. Um, and then I've got the product of a set of exponentials, which is the same as the exponential of a set of sum or a sum. And so now I'm summing over the ti's, and I have this uh, minus 1 over lambda uh, left over from the argument of the exponential. So that's my likelihood function. My likelihood function is 1 over lambda to the n times exponential of that sum right there over the, um, uh, over the data. Um, I take the log of both sides because I want to maximize the log likelihood, which is kind of a like numerically more stable way of doing it. So when I take the log likelihood on the left um, and then I uh, take the log on the right, I'm going to get the log of a product is the uh, sum of the logs of the, those two uh, values. So um, that works out to the log of 1 over lambda to the n, which is the same as log of lambda to the minus n. And you will remember from your log rules that you can write that as minus n times log of lambda. Um, and then the other um, component that we, uh, we had a product between this quantity here and this quantity here, and we took the log so we could separate them out. We got the log of this plus the natural log of the exponential, which of course cancel each other, and we're left with minus the argument here, minus 1 over lambda, the sum that appeared in the argument of the exponential. So this is my log likelihood function here um, and uh, for the exponential distribution. And now what I want to do is I want to maximize that. So how do I do that? I take the derivative of the log likelihood with respect to the parameter lambda. And I'm looking for the specific parameter value lambda hat, which um, basically maximizes the log likelihood. That is, uh, this quantity here equals 0 uh, when lambda equals that value. And so I substitute lambda hat for lambda in this case, and I just solve for lambda hat. Move this term over to the right-hand side, do a little bit of multiplication, some algebra. And what I end up with is that lambda hat uh, is equal to 1 over n times the sum over all of the uh, recurrence times. And so that turns out to be the analytical expression for the maximum likelihood estimate um, of the parameter for the exponential distribution. So it's quite a simple result. And we can apply it just to check and see if it works because we know that the optimal value of lambda is around 5 from you know, just looking at the graphs. And so we can check and see if it works. So we just plug in 7 for n, and then we sum all of those recurrence intervals together. And when we uh, carry that, uh, um, we evaluate the right-hand side there, it works out to 5.04 seconds, which is uh, what we kind of expected. So, uh, so uh, regardless of the, uh, the problem at hand, if it involves an exponential distribution, uh, this quantity here would, would give us the maximum likelihood estimate for the parameter lambda. And again, that's that optimal value would be the peak here, which occurs in round five. Okay, so um, let me go through another example, which involves estimating um, probabilities from the occurrences of events, um, you know, essentially as a proportion of the total number of trials. Um, and, and this is really a very useful um, concept. You know, uh, I think we talked about it in class. If you 
um, if you flipped a coin a uh, hundred times and 50 of those times uh, the coin came up head, you would say that uh, an estimate for the probability of getting ahead on any throw is about 50%, right? 50 out of 100. Well, when you when you do that, when you take the um, proportion as an as equivalent to the probability, um, you're making some assumptions about what's going on. And uh, so we're going to kind of explore those. And the other thing that's really cool in this analysis is that you can also get an estimate of the variance around that estimate. So we could say, well, given the number of throws um, and the probabilities, it's going to be 50% plus or minus, you know, some number. So, uh, so we can actually assign some uncertainty associated with our estimate of, of the probability. Okay, how does this work? So um, we're going to start with a scenario in which we have um, say a series of n Bernoulli trials as uh, the coin toss toss is a perfect example um, where the uh, ith out sorry with the outcome of the ith trial is categorized as either an event which we denote by uh, xi the random variable xi equal to one or a non-event uh, which we denote with uh, xi equal to zero. So, for example, we could say an event would be, uh, uh, you know, the coin landing in heads. And so we, every time the coin landed on a head, we'd say that the a random variable for that particular trial, say x5, was equal to 1. And then if it landed tails, maybe on the sixth row, we'd say x6 was equal to zero. So that's kind of the idea. Um, alternatively, uh, sort of another example that might be a little bit closer to home um, would be if you were collecting samples at the beach and you measured their TC concentrations. If the TC concentration was greater than 10,000, and remember that results in a beach posting, uh, you might denote that event by um, xi equal to 1. Or if it was less than 10 to the 4, not 104, <laughs> you might denote that as a non-event um, and give it xi equal to 0. So there's lots of ways this could play out, but the point is you have a bunch of trials, and then then the outcome of the trial is going to be um, you know either or either it's one thing or it's another. Um, and now we're going to um, uh, basically assume that the outcome of each trial is governed by the binomial distribution. So you'd have to look back and see what the assumptions are there. But basically, two of the key assumptions are that the probability that you're going to get an event in any trial is the same across all trials, um, and also that the trials are statistically independent. So those are two of the key, key, key assumptions. So given that the outcomes of each trial follow the binomial distribution, the, what we're given, basically, the question that we're given is, what is the maximum likelihood estimate for the probability p given a bunch of observations of trial outcomes? So if you throw that coin 100 or 200 times and you get a whole sequence of zeros and ones, how do you take that and estimate it from it a probability p for the outcome or like the probability that you're going to get heads on any given trial? Um, well, we're going to use the likelihood function, the maximum likelihood estimation approach. So we have to prepare a likelihood function. That's the first step. And remember, this is what the likelihood function looks like. Um, and in this case, the um, probability sort of density, uh, it was going to be replaced with probability mass associated with each of those um, um, trial outcomes. So those trials are denoted by x1, x2 through xn. Um, and each trial could either give you a zero, that would be a non-event, or it could give you an event, which, which would be one. And importantly, the probability mass function from the binomial um, distribution for a particular outcome is just going to be denoted here. If xi was zero, that would be the probability of a non-event, which would just be one minus p, right? So if I plug in zero for xi here, p to the zero is one, and 1 minus p to the 1 minus 0 is just 1 minus p. So for that particular outcome, uh, that is for xi equal to 0, the probability of occurring is 1 minus p, which makes sense because the probability of it occurring is p. Um, conversely, if xi equaled 1 in that sequence, then um, the probability uh, mass function associated with that would be p to the 1, okay, uh, times 1 minus p to the 0. So in that case, the probability mass uh, function would predict the outcome um, 
uh, the, the probability of that particular outcome occurring would be uh, just P. So hopefully that's clear. Um, and so we prepare the likelihood function from this probability mass function. We just uh, basically multiply all of these PMS together across all of the different um, trials going from one to N. Um, and I'm just substituting in for my PMF the um, form of the PMF that we just um, determined here. So that's that step. <clears throat> and now I've just kind of translated that to the top of the next page. Here's the uh, pay dirt. So basically we recognize that if you had a whole series of P's multiplied together and each of those raised to an X um, I, that would be the same as taking P to the sum of all of those X I's. Um, and likewise, if you had one minus P multiplied uh, together with a bunch of one minus X I's, that would be the same as just taking one minus P to the sum over all those one minus X I's. <clears throat> and this is kind of cool because if you think about this, what is in that sequence? What is the sum of? It's just Xi is either zero or one, right? And so it's a sum of a bunch of zeros and ones. And if you sum over all of the trials, that should equal the total number of events that occurred in the end trials. <clears throat> and so if we come down here, that's exactly what I've indicated. Um, the sum over all trials of Xi is just the total number of events that we got in those end trials. And likewise, the sum over n of 1 is just n. And then the sum over all n of Xi is just the same. It's uh, the uh, total number of events in n trials, x. So, um, so this, after all of that work, this is the likelihood function. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, that's the um, probability of a um, certain sequence of um, x events in n um, trials, right? <laughs> and the full binomial PMF would have the binomial coefficient here, reflecting the fact that you could have lots of different combinations of those. But anyway, that, that works out to be the formula likelihood function in this case. And so we do the usual. We take the log of both sides of this thing. Uh, in this case, uh, the log of p to the x is just x log p. Um, we multiply these two together so that when we take the log, they, they add together. Again, bring down the n minus x. So this is what we have here. <clears throat> and then we maximize that log likelihood function by taking its derivative with respect to the probability and looking for the probability, which maximizes a root, it's the root of this equation equal to zero. And so if we take the derivative of the log likelihood with respect to P, that's going to be X over a P evaluated, of course, at the optimal P, um, plus N minus X, that's just a constant as far as P is concerned, times the derivative of the natural log of one minus P, which is going to be one over one minus P, times the derivative of what's inside there. So we're using the chain rule, and that's just minus one. So I'm bringing that up to the top of the next page. Um, now all we have to do is solve for p hat. And so after a little bit of algebra, we find that p hat is just equal to x over n. In other words, it's the proportion of the n trials where, where we had events. And so this uh, ratio, which was kind of where we started, right? It was really intuitive that if you had uh, 50 heads and 100 throws, that the probability that you would get a head in a single throw was 50% that basically now we understand is a um, maximum likelihood estimate of the probability in the binomial distribution. And uh, you might say, well, that was a lot of work for nothing. But actually, it's quite interesting because, um, because it's telling us what assumptions we're making when we um, assume that a proportion um, of events and, and trials is equal to a probability. Basically, we're making the assumptions in the binomial distribution about um, about statistical independence and also a constant probability per event. Um, so let's come back to uh, the project here and kind of look at an example um, for for that. Um, so and and I basically I just went to um, one of you your guys' spreadsheet and I decided to analyze station zero, um, and um, and I wanted to know something very specific. First, I wanted to know at this particular station, and you know, for the three years that I was looking at, um, you know, how often did I get? What was the probability if I just sat there at that station and collected those samples and analyzed them? What is the probability that TC is going to be greater than one thousand? 
And um, and remember, I mean, you not you don't know, <laughs> you wouldn't remember this because you never saw it. But um, actually, I can go to the spreadsheet and show you. Uh, let me just pull that spreadsheet up so you know I'm not lying. I would never lie, not to you anyway. Um, okay, Let's see if this works. Yep. Okay. So um, basically, this is the uh, the data that I was looking at. So this is the raw TC data here. Um, so you can see this column, this is raw TC data. Um, this is the raw salinity data. And then I basically sorted uh, both the TC data and the salinity data, but using the TC as the sorting wave. So basically then all of these values are sorted um, by TC from smallest to largest. So you can see the largest value is at about 24,000 there. And, um, and then what I wanted to do, so if I look at the total number of samples then that have a TC measurement, I come to the bottom, my total count, uh, which I got just using this uh, equal count command, um, my total count is 442. And um, there's lots of different ways to do this. I was just kind of um, really systematic. I wanted to know if TC, you know, the number of events where TC was greater than 1,000. And so basically the way I did that was I set up an if command. So I said, if this cell here is greater than 1,000, I'm going to put a 1 in this um, row. Otherwise, I'm going to put a 0. So that's what that if statement means. And so you can see there's a bunch of zeros here. And I scroll on down to um, where I my TC values exceed a thousand, so that would be here, and you can see now I've got a whole series of ones. Okay, so that's just like the coin toss, except I've got in this case I'm not getting like zero zero one one zero zero zero. I'm getting a bunch of zeros and then one because these data are sort of sorted from uh, lowest to highest TC. And so then if I just sum up over that column of zeros and ones, I'm going to find out the total number of events that, um, or samples that I had uh, TC concentrations greater than 1,000. And you can see that on there. It's just a sum command. And when I do that, I've got 45 samples out of 442 total samples which had TC greater than 1,000. So if I come back to my um, PowerPoint presentation again, Okay, so um, out of 442 samples, I had 45 that exceeded uh, 1,000. And so assuming that these exceedances follow the binomial distribution, which could be a big assumption, might not be correct for a lot of reasons, um, we would estimate, uh, or from the maximum likelihood estimate, the probability that a given sample will exceed the, the 1,000 threshold is gonna just be the ratio or the proportion of the number of events, in this case 45, over the number of trials, in this case 442, or about 10%. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, now I want to ask a slightly more sophisticated question. Um, I have a theory that um, TC are carried to the ocean in um, stormwater runoff. And stormwater runoff is basically fresh water, has very little salt, and so when it enters the ocean, it's going to create a little plume of fresher water, uh, which means that when I sample um, that plume, it's going to have both a low salinity and also a high TC. So that's my theory. To test my theory, I want to look and see what the probability is that TC is greater than 1,000 conditioned on salinity being less than 30. And that's interesting because if I go back here, um, remember I just looked at the probability that TC was greater than 1,000 across all samples. It was about 10%. So if my theory is correct, I would predict that the probability that TC is greater than 1,000 conditioned on salinity being less than 30 will be much greater than 10%. So that's basically, it's a test of my theory, right? From set theory, we know that the conditional probability can be expressed as a probability of the intersection between TC being greater than 1,000 and salinity being less than 30 divided by the probability that salinity is less than 30. And um, what we're going to do is use the maximum likelihood estimate approach to get estimates for each of these probabilities from proportions. So um, again, assuming these two events, TC greater than 1,000, salinity less than 30, follow the binomial distribution, 
we can basically calculate the right-hand side here from, um, from proportions. So for the salinity case, basically we'd be looking at the total number of events defined as salinity less than 30 divided by the total number of trials. And, um, and again, I can go back to my Excel spreadsheet and show you what that looks like. I can lose try. Okay. Here we go. So um, let me go back up to the top here. So I have this column called salinity event. And if I click on it and look at um, what it is, it basically is another if statement. It's asking if the value in that cell is less than 30, put a 1 in this row, otherwise put a 0. And so you can see there's a whole series of zeros. Remember, these salinity values were sorted, but they were sorted using TC as the uh, master variable. So uh, they've been rearranged, but but each salinity TC pair has been um, maintained. In other words, they weren't randomized. So um, so we're going, remember, this was sorted from lowest TC to highest. And so if we just kind of scroll down to look for salinity events, maybe we can just compare that with TC events. We see a lot of zeros. So basically, when, salinity, when TC is low, we don't see hardly any. We really don't see any. Uh, salinity events, that is salinity less than 30. So that's kind of promising for my theory. Um, so I keep going. Yep, <laughs> keep scrolling down. I just see a bunch of zeros. I'm not even sure you can see much of a change uh, in your, your um, uh, the video. But anyway, so we're just seeing a bunch of zeros. <laughs> it's like, where are the ones? Oh, there's a couple of ones there. So there would be a case where salinity was greater than or less than 30. Sorry. So you can see it was less than 30. And here's another case where it was less than 30. Um, still know that they aren't obviously associated with TC events in this case, though, because we're getting zeros in those two positions. So we keep scrolling down. And what's really interesting, now we picked up some TC events, right? And now we're beginning to see lots and lots of salinity cases, which are uh, ones as well. So there's one there, 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 and there. So just looking at the data, you can see that salinity events, that is, a, samples which have salinity less than 30 occur much more frequently when, when we get TC events, that is TC values greater than 1,000. So if you just looked at the data, you'd say, yeah, the theory is probably correct. But now let's actually calculate the, um, the thing quantitatively. So, um, so let's first look at the uh, probability that salinity is, is less than um, 30. Well, if we count up, we do the sum again, uh, sum across uh, all of the uh, the uh, rows there in the um, salinity event, we get 11. So uh, basically, we have 11 samples uh, which had salinity less than um, 30 out of a total of 442 samples. And so if we come back to the PowerPoint presentation. So coming back over here, basically, then we were trying to calculate this proportion, that is the number of events where salinity or number of samples where salinity was less than 30 over the total number of samples. That's 11 over 442, which works out to about 2.5% of the samples had salinity less than 30. Um, so that takes care of this denominator of that conditional probability. So now we need to deal with the numerator. How do we do that? Um, well, we're going to be looking for the or counting up the, the um, total number of events where uh, TC was greater than 1,000 and salinity was less than 30. And let me show you kind of an elegant way of doing that. Let me go back to the Excel spreadsheet. Kind of rocketing back and forth here. All right. Um, and so what I can do, let me go back to the top of the spreadsheet, is I'm going to create a new column, which I'm calling TC and salinity events. That would be the intersection of TC and salinity. And I'm going to define it as the product of the TC event and the salinity event. So when either of those are zero, the TC and salinity event is going to be zero. But if both of them were one, and, and I can kind of scroll down and show you that there are certainly examples where that's the case. So you see, for example, here's a case where we've got a one because both salinity and TC um, uh, fulfilled that event criteria. Um, and so we, we have a one here for the intersection of them. So uh, anyway, I do that, and then I count up all of those intersecting events, and I get a total of eight um, of those events in uh, 442 samples. <clears throat> so I come back to my 
PowerPoint presentation here. And I promise we're almost done. I know this is kind of a very long slog here. Um, <clears throat> and so basically then for this intersection, the um, number of events where TC is greater than 1,000, salinity is less than 30 is 8, or over the total number of samples, 442, equals about 1.8%. And so that is the numerator of this conditional probability expression. And so, ta-da, I can take the ratio of the two. Uh, so I take the um, intersect probability of the intersection, 0.018, divided by the probability that salinity is less than 30, 0.025, and I get that the conditional probability is 0.72. And that is a lot bigger than the probability that TC is just going to be greater than 1,000 without that conditional. So that would uh, tend to support my theory that TC is transported with freshwater blubs in, in the uh, nearshore waters. The last thing I want to do is, is point out that um, the book also derives um, it's actually equation 6.28a if you want to learn how this is done. Um, also derives a estimate for the variance around those um, probability estimates using the proportional approach that we just talked about. And basically, um, the idea is that the variance of that, um, that probability estimate, which we consider to be a random variable, is going to be that probability times its complement, 1 minus the probability, divided by the total number of samples uh, or trials. And so if we take the square root of both sides, we would get the standard deviation for that um, probability estimate as being square root of p times 1 minus p over n. So that's kind of cool. Um, and so let's go ahead and calculate uh, the standard deviation for these two probability estimates. Um, remember, uh, for Tc greater than 1,000, the probability estimate was 0.1. So my um, corresponding standard deviation for that probability estimate is going to be 0.1 times the complement, 0.9, divided by the total number of samples, 442, or uh, 0.014. Uh, likewise, the probability that both TC is a greater than 1,000 and salinity is less than 30, their intersection, is going to be, um, remember, the probability is 0.72. So I take the uh, standard deviation about that probability is the square root of 0.72 times the complement, which is 0.28, divided by the total number of samples that had a salinity uh, less than 30, because that's a conditioning event, and I end up with a standard deviation of 0.14. So um, in the end, basically, then I can say that the probability that TC is greater than 1,000 is 0.1 plus or minus 0.014 and that the probability that Tc is greater than 1,000 when salinity is less than 30 is 0 0.72 plus or minus 0 0.14. So even taking the uh, variability of these probability estimates as um, calculated from um, the, uh, the um, standard deviation estimates here, um, to even taking that variability into account, these two numbers look to be different. Um, although we're going to talk about hypothesis testing approaches that would allow us to determine statistically um, whether these two numbers are, are different or not, but I'm just telling you they are. <laughs> okay, so uh, with that, um, I'm going to uh, shut this down and uh, let you get back to your life. Sorry, it was such a long lecture, <laughs> and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you actually tomorrow morning. Okay.